All right, so we are recording, so we're good to go there. I'm going to share, oh my goodness, content. I'm going to just share my screen with you all so you can see everything. And take you over to our presentation. All right, so this is the disclosure um, Tammy sent me. Um, do, is there like a requirement? Do I need to pause for like two minutes for everyone to read, Tammy? Anything like that? Okay. Well, then we're just going to keep going. <laughs> so, open access. Um, uh, again, this is what Alexa is going to be really digging into today. I'm going to sort of swoop in at the end and give you a few resources. So what we're really going to cover um, is what is open access? Um, why is it an important thing for us to talk about? as um, scholars. Um, one thing that I've heard some questions from people in the College of Nursing and Health Sciences, I've heard questions about how do you know whether or not you can trust open access? It doesn't have that long legacy of, um, you know, um, credibility necessarily that certain journals do, like um, JAMA or New England Journal of Medicine. So how do we trust these sources? Um, and how can the library help you um, contribute or um, identify open access resources? Finally, like I said, I'm going to swoop in at the end and show you some resources specifically for um, nursing. Um, Miguel, I'm sorry, I did think this was just a nursing thing, but I will also show you how to find health sciences um, resources as well. Um, so, so hopefully this will be useful to everyone. And um, that is uh, where I'm going to hand it off to Alexa. So I will stop sharing my screen. And I will pass it over to Alexa. Oh, that should have happened, Alexa. Yeah. You're good. So you can Take it away. see my screen. Uh, I see a black screen. Mm. Let's try that again. Okay. You see my screen now? Beautifully. Wonderful. Okay. So as Emily said, we're going to start off with what is open access and why is it important? Um, to start, I'm going to start from the library perspective. So why are two librarians coming to talk to you about what is open access and why we think it's important? Historically speaking, um, universities and libraries all over the world have had have given their students, staff and faculty access to research through print subscriptions. So back before we had this awesome thing called the internet, we used to buy things in print and they would get shipped to the library and then we would have them on our shelves for our students and researchers to go through and access that way. And we purchased these either directly from the publisher or we would do kind of a subscription agency thing. Um, but there wasn't too much of a middle person uh, and there wasn't this idea that we have now with digital subscriptions where you can buy bulk packages of journal titles. So with the internet, we thought, great, we can buy things and it will get here faster and it will be more accessible for students, staff and faculty because they can access things with the internet online from their dorm room, from home, from the lab, et cetera. However, this, comes with some of its own new difficulties, such as purchasing versus licensing. We still have the option of purchasing a lot of titles, which means we own them indefinitely. Licensing is where, as long as we're paying for it, we have access to it. This causes its own problems because library budgets don't increase every year necessarily, and so at some point we might have to make a decision of letting a title go and that might let the title go, not just for future things that are published, but for everything that they've published up until now. Um, so there are some things, some issues with that. So subscriptions, when we talk about what is a subscription, it's the old fashioned or the traditional model of paying to read. So readers are paying for access. Um, the library is often that middle person of the library's paying so that you have access to all of this information. So is this sustainable? Yes, no, maybe <laughs> it's kind of the answer. If you look at that graph on the right, I know it's outdated. It's from the most recent year um, that we have information is from 2011. However, it still paints a pretty vivid picture. Um, you can see that this is monograph and serial costs in ARL libraries from 1986 to 2011. 
Oh, I see a hand. Hi. Uh, I hope I did not interrupt you. <laughs> no, please. Uh, this is uh, Leslie. Hi. Um, how do you decide to discontinue a certain title of a journal? Like for next year, what's your criteria to make a decision? I'm sure you know you guys have a limited budget, so you have to make a decision at some point for next year, right? Yeah, that is a great question. Um, and I'm actually not the person who makes that decision alone, thankfully. Um, but our um, head of research resource data, I'm sorry, I, we always everyone in the library always forgets the name of their department. Um, but Derek Hyatt is the head of our resource management and discovery department. And so it it's a it's a lot of factors. Um, it comes with cost, but also with use. Um, and we do often survey faculty opinion. Um, I would say that the the underlying cause is usually cost. Can the library afford it? Yay or nay? Um, Emily, do you have any anything else to add there? Um, just that um, we uh, just how the library has a liaison to you. Y'all have a liaison to us. The, your college, your liaison is Susan Greathouse. So if you have a very strong opinion about keeping something, or um, if you know, I send out on the list serve a question. You know, can we get rid of this? Um, you are welcome to give me feedback. You can give Susan feedback to give to me. Um, but. For the most part, it's going to come down to can we afford it um, and is it being used? Um, we do in one instance, we have through the library access to um, JBI, the Joanna Briggs Institute, um, and that is actually paid for by the College of Nursing and Health Sciences. So if there is something that we can't afford, but you want us to sort of like host access to it, um, that's another option if the College of Nursing and Health Sciences um, sees something that's missing and is able to sort of supplement um, or, or able to find that funding. Um, we're happy to make that available on the library as well. Yeah, and I would just like, you know, add that having materials is never taken lightly. Um, it's not just, oh, we can't afford it, we'll get rid of it. Um, we do take um, people's opinions into consideration as well as we can look at if it's an online usage how much use is getting out of it. Um, and I think to some extent we can look at who those users are, um, which would definitely, you know, weigh in the decision making process. Um, if you all are interested in learning more about those decisions, we could definitely host another um, another workshop kind of like this with Derek. Um, he is the expert uh, in how we're spending our money um, in terms of purchase, you know, purchasing and licensing journals and books um, and he is kind of the, the all-knowing one in that area um, so please let us know and we can either get you in contact if you have specific questions or we can um, ask him if he'd be willing to to participate in one of these in the future um, so going back to my graph real quick i just want to point out that if you look at that that line that's going almost straight up that's serial expenditures over 20 some years, and it goes up by 402%. Our budgets did not increase by 402%. Um, so the cost of subscriptions went up a lot. So that's kind of the library perspective of what's the big deal. The big deal is that having access to journals is really expensive. Um, going forward, so, that's the library perspective. And now we're going to take a quick look at kind of the researcher author perspective. Um, back in early 2000s, I believe it was 2002, the Budapest Open Access Initiative came together and said, you know, the point of research, the point of disseminating our research is for the sake of inquiry and knowledge and for further research. Of course, you're all faculty who have your own agendas, which can include promotion and tenure. Um, it can include the university has the perspective of increasing our prestige and things like this. But the root tradition of why we you know, publish our work is for you know, continuing this, this knowledge and continuing inquiry in, the, in your field of research. So the idea was let's make 
information accessible, removing the access to barriers, um, and, and kind of balancing out, making research more accessible, more equitable. So, of course, this went hand in hand with um, the internet because it costs a lot less to host things, to find things. You don't have to travel to an archive or to a certain lab to get to their research. You don't have to wait weeks in the mail for something to get shipped to you so you can read it. Um, and it does make the playing field much more level. Of course, as we are currently realizing right now during COVID-19, there is still the digital divide and we are experiencing how our students don't necessarily have access to the Internet or they don't have the devices necessary to access the Internet. And so this it's while it's leveling the playing field a little bit. Um, there are still many issues to contend with. So that's kind of the researcher author perspective of what is open access and why do we want open access. So now I'm going to get into a little bit about the modeling of open access. Um, and this is a lot of information. Um, please do interrupt me with questions if I say something that you find confusing. Um, on this slide, we're talking about the article level of open access. So if it, one article in a journal is open and what the different models are. So in terms of gold open access, this means that an article is immediately open via an article processing or sometimes an article publishing charge or an APC. Um, these payments are often paid by or on behalf of the author. A lot of times authors may use grant money that funded their research to also pay for these APCs if their grants stipulate that they have to make their research available through open access. Um, green open access is that your work is accessible via an open repository. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the TAMU CC institutional repository. There are subject specific repositories. This might be just a data repository or it might be um, a repository that hosts articles as well as data. The thing, the caveat with green open access is that there's all often a embargo, which means the publisher says, yes, you can put your work in an open repository, but only after a certain amount of time. So after six months since it's been published, then it can be green open up to three years. So this option is, um, you know, more useful for some for some areas of study than others. And in, in an area like nursing and health sciences, where things are changing fairly quickly, an embargo, yes, it makes it open eventually, but it might not be useful to readers. Um, so that's something to keep in mind there. And bronze is less often discussed and is less um, frequent um, in terms of, of the commonality of this model. However, COVID-19 is again a great example. Um, I'm sure many of you have heard if publishers are making a lot of any research related to the coronavirus or COVID-19 open, which means that um, researchers, doctors, don't, nurses don't have to pay to get access to that research right now. And what a lot of these publishers have published on their website of like our COVID-19 policy is that access to this information will last for the duration of the pandemic. Well, what does that mean is one of these issues with it when it's temporary? Because that could mean during the pandemic in China, if the publisher is based in China, China's already getting back to work, right? So they might close down their, their put that paywall back up, um, whereas we still need it in the United States and other countries around the world. So bronze is, you know, temporary, but it can be useful in certain periods of time, like we're seeing right now. On the right hand side, I have some more definitions um, going back to the green open access. When you deposit your work in an open repository, um, publishers often stipulate what version of your work can go in a repository. Sometimes it's that final ver final published version with all of the peer review edits made, all of the copy editing and everything, and it's all pretty, and you can put that in the repository. 
sometimes they stipulate that you can only put a preprint and definition of preprint can vary by publisher. Emily and I are more than happy to help you find what your publisher um, version of, of record um, that you can put in our repository or in any other repository is. Um, we have a handy tool, um, but you can also ask us and we're more than happy to help find that for you. So another thing that's confusing about open access, because it wasn't already confusing enough, is um, the different versions of what we mean by open. Um, and this has to do with copyright. Um, Gratee open access is information that is available free of charge, but the work typically holds traditional copyright and licensing restrictions. So what we mean by copyright, um, very briefly, is anything that you have put into that is original and creative and you've put into um, a fixed format, whether you've typed it out or you've made a recording of yourself talking about it, um, or you've collected that data and then put it in into a, you know, formatted it in a creative and original way, you own the copyright to that work. Um, you are, as the copyright owner, able to put certain licensing restrictions or more free licensing restrictions on your work. If you may have noticed um, that on these slides, I have at the bottom some strings of letters. On this slide, it says attribution CC by NC Lisa Janik Hinchcliffe. Lisa made a presentation a couple of weeks ago on a lot of what I'm talking about, and she shared her slides under the Creative Commons license, which is what that CC stands for, by NC, which means I'm allowed to reuse her work as long as I give her attribution and I'm not selling her work. So the NC is non-commercial. Um, Creative Commons licensing is a very common um, way of licensing your work, but it can get kind of confusing. Um, so if you do have any questions about whether you can use someone's work or if you want to license your work under a Creative Commons license, again, the library is happy to help you. Any questions at this point in time? Feel free to raise it. Oh yeah, go ahead. This is Miguel, quick question. Um, I've, I've often thought about that, uh, I guess the citation or the what you put on the bottom. Um, I guess, is there something, where can we go to learn about that attribution line that, that's down there? Uh, I guess there's different combinations of acronyms or letters that you could put on there. Where, where could we learn more about that so we can kind of stamp our, our material as well? Yeah, definitely. Um, Creative Commons, um, their website is fabulous and they kind of walk you through what you want to be, what you want users to be able to do with your work. Um, and, and then they will assist you with um, the kind of license that you should attribute to that. And I can definitely show you that. Um, Emily posted a link in chat um, and we can also um, I'm going to do some demonstration of, of our website and we can go to creativecommons.org as well at that point in time. Um, but they do have a really handy tool that walks you through those steps. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we discussed on the previous slide the article level um, of open access. And that means um, for individual articles within a journal. There's also journal level of open access, and there are several different um, versions or uh, models for open access there. Hybrid is a traditionally subscription-based journal that has the option for gold articles funded by that article processing charge or another form of pay payment. So if we go back to the article level, that gold level is considered you are paying into a hybrid journal. Hybrid is not my favorite model because if we look at it from the library perspective, um, the library is paying for subscriptions to these journals. And then we also have the open access publication fund. And if you want to publish your research in this journal and you wanna make it open, are all for that, but if you make it open through this hybrid journal, we would be paying that 
APC charge, as well as subscribing to the journal as well. So effectively, we'd be paying for that information twice. Um, so there are some like transition models that are happening right now um, that are making hybrid. Hybrid journals are trying to go towards fully gold open access. Um, but as it stands, hybrid can get a little, a little contentious. Um, fully gold open access journals are those that anyone can, as long as they have internet to access, they can read any journal article ever um, in this journal. They are funded by APCs or some other payment model. So rather than you pay to read, as in a subscription-based model, you are paying to publish. Again, there are issues with that. Authors don't often have the funds to pay. I will say, though, that gold open access journals often have lower APCs than hybrid open access journals. So hybrid open access journals are already getting money from subscriptions, and then they're charging a lot to make your journal article open. Um, and when I say a lot, this could be from three to $5,000. Whereas gold can be a couple hundred dollars to sometimes $2,500. Um, and it, it depends on the journal um, and there are exceptions, but that's just kind of a, a general model. Platinum or diamond, I think this is, uh, this is the term that is used interchangeably, are where the entire uh, journal is fully open. Um, but there are no APCs, so you as the author do not need to pay anything to get your art article published. It is um, funded in some other way, um, and this could be institutionally or sponsor supported. Um, an example on the next slide it can be um, the Association of College and Research Libraries has their CNRL news, and I don't have to be a dues paying member to read this, but they are funded by dues paying members. So it's not just the journal that's being that's being supported, um, but that is the platinum or diamond uh, model for open access. So why do we care? <laughs> um, even if we aren't interested in making information available or we're skeptical about um, how we're going to pay for that, which there are some very um, legitimate concerns. There are some institutional, governmental, funder, and society um, participants who are pushing for open access. So some institutions like Harvard, MIT, and the University of Illinois at Urbana are mandating that anything that their faculty publish must be open access in some form. So this could be old open access, it could be green open access. You just have to put a copy of whatever you publish into the repository and there might be an embargo that depends on the policy of the institution. Um, some governmental agencies will give grant money, but then they mandate that your money goes or that your data or your final research product goes is open access. It might be in an open repository or it might be in an open um, open journal. And then there are funders like the Wellcome Trust and Gates Foundation who are mandating that anyone who receives grant money from them also publish open. There are some communities of practice, some coalitions of institutions and libraries that are pushing for open, um, making things more open more quickly. Um, the 2.5% initiative was an initiative where academic institutions, their libraries put 2.5% of their annual budget towards making things open. Um, I don't believe we are participating in that right now. There's a coalition of funders. This is mostly European based right now with the idea that it'll trickle, trickle down to US funders. Um, this plan S, which is moving people, moving publishers towards being more fully open access. And then there are some conferences and some communities of practice. The Spark Journal Negotiation Community of Practice um, aims to help university libraries negotiate with journal publishers um, towards more open um, policies. Um, some successful um, libraries have been UC uh, out of the California system, as well as I think it's UF or USF in Florida. 
Okay, any questions about anything thus far? Yes. Um, hi, Alexa. This is uh, Teresa Garcia. I don't, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, um, both of you. Um, I just had a question when you were talking about the different types of open access. Where would you usually find that listed? It, I mean, I, you know, would it be in the author um, guidelines or you know when you when you go to a journal because remember ever seeing that anywhere? That's a great question. Sometimes um, publishers will say it, but in a language that is different from everything I just went over. Um, so my favorite is actually the first bullet on this slide, which is the Directory of Open Access Journals, which Emily is going to discuss um, in a few slides. Um, and what the directory of open access journals, um, it's basically a database. You can put in your ISSN or journal title, and it will tell you if it is a fully open access journal. Um, some other ways of evaluating open access publications or just understanding how to learn more um, is on this slide. And, um, one thing, the second to last bullet, article publishing costs and copyright ownership should be clearly indicated on the publication's website. Um, so it might not say explicitly, we are a hybrid journal. They might say you can make your, um, your work open access by paying X number of dollars. And that information should be clear before you submit your work. If you're having trouble finding that information, again, Emily and I are more than happy to help you. We spend all day looking for research, you know, looking for resources online. Um, and publishers, you know, some publishers like to make it very out in the open. Um, other publishers like to kind of either use weird jargon or their own language to make it harder. Um, to understand, and we're actually going to talk about Sherpa Romeo, which is another database um, in a little bit as well. And that is a great resource for can I um, self archive or use green open access for my work? Um, but that is, yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, so this slide again, we are definitely going to share our slides because I know there's a lot of different links on this slide. Um, this information is also on the library website under one of our uh, research guides. Um, but it, it, this is a lot of different resources if you want to learn more or if you're looking into a specific um, open access publication as well. Um, so I've talked a little bit about some of these things. Um, we do have an institutional repository. We can host your work. Emily and I can help you find out if you can host your work using um, Sherpa Romeo or if you have your publication agreement, we can take a look at that with you as well. Um, sometimes we need to contact publishers, um, which we have form letters uh, and we're happy to submit those on your behalf as well. Um, we do have the open access publication fund. I will say that we are tapped out for the year. We were generously provided $15,000 in October of 2019, and we spent that out by mid-February. We were um, provided an additional $12,000, so a total of $27,000 spent by mid-March. Um, so we're really hoping to have more money next year. Um, uh, with COVID-19 and you know the typical um, budget uncertainty, we're not sure if we'll be funded or how much we will be funded, but we're hoping to have that with our next fiscal budget. Um, again, your author rights. If you wanna self archive any of your work you've already published, we can help you find out if you can and what version you can, um, and we can help you submit it to our repository or another repository if you would like. And for future works um, to protect your copyright and to assert that you want to put your work into the repository, um, we are more than happy to help you with that. There is some, you know, kind of blanket statement um, that you can add to your publication agreements. I will say that we're kind of in a transition time where most publishers will maybe not 
give you the option openly, but if you ask them for it, they will agree to it. They might agree to it with an embargo period. I have never heard and no one I've ever spoken to has ever heard of a publisher where they have accepted your work. You ask for, um, for protection of your copyright with as simple as I want to self archive my work and then withdrawing the your publication. So you might need to negotiate a little bit. Again, Emily and I are more than happy to help you with that. Um, and then Emily is going to talk a little bit about finding um, nursing open access journals. And then the last thing is that if you want to go full all the way and you want to host your own open access journal at TAMU CC, it's a lot of work, um, but we can host um, your own open access journal and we'd be happy to talk to you about that at a later time. It's kind of a big topic. Um, before I hand it off to Emily, I'm just going to go to our library website and show you a couple of things. Um, so from our library homepage, if we go to the repository, our repository is hosted in DSpace with um, in support of the Texas Digital Library. As you can see, we organize it by um, college. And if we go into College of Nursing and Health Science, you can see that the only collection we have at the moment are the Doctor of Nursing Practice Project Reports. Um, but if we go, I'm just going to go into Science and Engineering real quick and just show you we do have a Faculty Works collection. So we'd be happy to host your work here. It's really easy to set up a collection um, and get your works added. It takes me about 30 minutes to do so. Um, and then under Research and Help, we have this Scholarly Communications page. Um, and under Publishing, we have some information about the Publishing Fund, the Institutional Repository. We also can mint DOIs. Um, if you are willing to have your work hosted in the repository, we can mint a DOI for you. A DOI is a Digital Object Identifier, and this can be used for data sets um, or for previously published works, individual book chapters, things like that. Here's an example of Sherpa Romeo. So um, you can see that Sherpa Romeo has kind of color coded um, author or publishing policies. So it will give you a color based on the journal title and then tell you if you can archive your preprint and postprint or the publisher's version or if they don't have any information at which point we can uh, contact the publisher on a case by case basis. Um, and Lastly, if you go to our research guides, and again, a lot of these links are in our slides, and you can always contact us if you forget where this information is, um, but we do have more information on open access and the Open Access Publication Fund um, and copyright. Um, we have, so here it breaks down the copyright, the Creative Commons licenses a little bit. Um, and like I said, and Emily um, put a link in the chat, you can also go to creativecommons.org and they will walk you through um, how to do it. So I believe if you go to share your work, um, it will go through, choose what features, how you want people to be able to use your work or how you want to restrict people. Um, and then they will get you a license at the end of that process. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and give Emily presenting. Okay, I am now the presenter. Here we go. All right, so sharing my content again. Um, and way down to the bottom. So, um, what we're going to talk about now is sort of how to start like right now, how to dig into things. Um, for um, folks in the College of Nursing and Health Sciences, um, I've got here on this slide, this big, long, ugly list of the topics that we are 100% confident there are open access journals um, in those subjects. I got this list from the Directory of Open Access Journal Subsets. I'm sorry, the Directory of Open Access Journals. 
um, which Alexa mentioned earlier. I'm going to jump into that now um, and um, so we can all get familiar with it. When you get to the directory of open access journals, it's just doaj.org. Um, and you know, it's got its like it's got its news, it's got its information. Um, if you are looking for um, journals either that you are interested in publishing in or you just want to sort of support open access journals and use their information, you can go to um, you can search for something in particular if you know what journal you want. Go to browse subjects. Um, and this is where I got that big, long, ugly list. Within medicine, um, there are lots of options. Um, there is nursing. Um, there is also um, other things that might be useful that sort of are like in the same atmosphere, right? You've got maybe um, you are doing research on um, gynecology. Maybe you are interested in pediatrics or um, there's um, pharma right down here. Public aspects of medicine is an interesting one as well um, and worth looking into. So just because you know you are used to publishing in journals that have the word nursing smack in the title, um, you, you might be able to find open access journals that meet sort of the same needs um, and uh, where your work is still relevant um, and open access. In these um, folders, I'm just going to click on nursing, but we can go to any of these if anyone's curious. Um, it, clicking on it should. That didn't do it, did it? What are we doing here, guys? I don't know what's happening right now. These are usually very clickable. I got nothing. All right, usually when you click them, they open up and they show you the entire folder of um, uh, open access journals. Within just nursing, um, and again, sorry, Miguel, I thought that this was um, just the nursing side of things, but within nursing, there are um, 111 open access nursing journals. Um, seven of those are produced in the US, are published in the US. We've got them all listed out on this slide. Um, so if you're interested in any of these, um, I'm more than happy to sort of like um, work with you and we can sort of take a look at those like author agreements. We can take a look at the um, uh, the journals, often the journals about page or FAQs is where that um, open access information is stored. Um, if we, maybe let's just do a search and see if that gets us what we want. So Emily, if you go back to that browse subjects, go back to navigate back to nursing, um, I think if you click on nursing again and then scroll up. Oh, thank you. On the right there. Yeah. I don't know if that's what it looked like before. That is exactly what it looked like before. And um, I forgot about this part. So um, I'm going to blame it on this database. I think it's counterintuitive, but whatever. So clicking on view journals and articles will take you to the full list. Like I said, um, we can see over here, there are 111 nursing journals that are open access um, and over 45,000 articles. Um, you can limit this down. Um, you can limit by subject. Maybe you wanna change this to something else. Um, and you can also, mm, I'm not getting into that. Um, the DOAJ seal is just kind of like there, like this is a really, really good open access. Um, there is more information about the DOAJ seal on their website, um, but as you can see, there are a handful, 2,400 um, DOAJ seal art journals, um, articles um, versus 43,000. So um, that's, it's kind of like their, their seal of approval, essentially. Yeah, it's the, I don't know, gold standard might be the wrong phrase to use because gold means something else open access content context. But um, yeah, that's sort of your like, this is the best of the best, most open of the openest journals. Um, when we click on these, let's find something in English. Okay, let's go to a journal. Nursing plus open, I'm gonna click on that. Um, here we have some information already. 
Um, it's got the APC, how much is it going to charge you if you get accepted. Um, it also lets you know that there's no charge to um, uh, submit to this, which I think is just a nice thing to know. Uh -huh. Yes, um, I did not mention that earlier, but when you are looking at a open access publication, if it's asking you to pay money when you're submitting to for not when you're publishing, but I want to submit to this journal. Um, if they're asking you to pay money, I would be very hesitant at that point. Um, there are some models that are in in that advocate for this and we can talk about that later, but it's a complicated model, um, but most of the time if they're asking you to pay up front they are going to give you a rejection in 15 minutes so they just want your money um, so be very hesitant at that point great thank you that's a really good point that's a, a quick tip to sort of like how do how do we trust these um, the other tip is if it's in this directory of open access journals we pretty much trust it this is something that has been you know reviewed it's been looked at um, and it's um, these are credible journals to use um, also on this page, again, this is the page for Nursing Plus Open, the journal. Um, it has editorial information, so we can see it's got double-blind peer review, um, and you can also dig into the aims and scope if you want to, um, or you can come to its homepage and scroll through, look for the About page or Authors Information or FAQ to get more um, information about how they are open and how you can specifically make your piece, your work open. Um, so uh the next day oh i guess that's sort of all i wanted to touch on i just wanted to dig into the doaj and let everyone know um, that it is it sort of functions like any other database um and it's a pretty comfortable thing to use if you want um help digging through that um like miguel if you and i want to sort of um, get together via webex sometime we can sort of scroll through see what's applicable to your field um happy to do that Okay, thank you. But I, I think where you, uh, you know, going to DOAJ, I'll, I'll probably be able to try to tackle it. Uh, and then if I have trouble finding what I'm looking for, I'll definitely give you a call. Perfect, perfect. And that's what I like to hear. I think this is a nice, it's a pretty nice um, system, the DOAJ. Um, it's, uh, it's usable, it's comfortable, it looks like other databases that you are familiar using as researchers. So. Um, the next thing we've got is just time for questions. Questions for me, questions for Alexa, questions about, um, you know, how we purchase databases, free for all. I have a question. Um, surprise. Uh, <laughs> Love it. The, the, okay, so kind of what, uh, what, what, what Teresa was mentioning, Dr. Garcia, is that you know, I hadn't heard of doaj.org either. It's not something that, you know, they pretty much tell you to go search, you know. Uh, I guess what I want to know is how is it interpreted? Uh, is it is it recommended that we, uh, gosh, how is it how is it looked at in the industry? Is it like subpar or what, what are we looking at here? So right now, um, of course, from the librarian's perspective, we are very, very, very much in favor of open access. Um, particularly, we're of the belief that most of us, our research is funded by taxpayers, therefore they should have access. They, they paid for our research, they should get to see the findings. So that's our perspective. We're big fans. But um, there is a little, there is a conversation happening in scholarly communities, um, and it's usually at a university level some universities are saying things to the effect of if your journal doesn't have a certain um, impact you know, score, then they won't consider it as favorably as someone who did publish in, say, like JAMA or the New England Journal of Medicine, things that have been around a long, long time. That is the thing with open access is that they, it sends it's a relatively new, um, like, um, since this has come about uh, in the age of the internet, it doesn't have the like decades of impact reports to build on. Um, so it really depends university to university. Um, and it's going to depend probably on, on on your committees. Alexa, do you want to sort of dig into that anymore? Um, no, I would say that it is very, 
very university specific um, and it can be even department specific. Um, when I talked a little bit about, you know, uh, university policies, um, some of those policies were able to be, um, you know, voted on by faculty senate at their university because it started in one department or one college um, and they made it possible. Um, and so they edited their promotion and tenure criteria, um, things like that. So it, it's kind of, you know, we, there's a lot of times where a top down uh, mandate doesn't work. It really needs to be on the part of the faculty. Um, and I know that that can be extremely daunting and frustrating and even scary, especially if you are an untenured professor um, working towards tenure. Um, there, there's a lot of argument out there that tenured professors should be the ones who are publishing only open because they don't have any pressure not to. Um, but that's um, that doesn't actually solve the problem either. Um, so I would definitely approach uh, people within your department, within your college, um, and and have a conversation about it. Um, there are studies, and I'd be happy to point you to them. Um, I don't know them off the top of my head, but the more um, the more open your work is, the more likely you are to be cited. Um, and so there are things that are coming out which are called it's not it's not that new, but called alt metrics. Whereas rather than looking at the impact factor of a journal, they are looking at the impact of a particular article. So how many times has your article been downloaded? How many times has it been shared? via social media even, it hasn't been tweeted or, sh or shared on Facebook. Um, and how many times has your article been cited rather than how, you know, the citation factors of the journal as a whole. So there are some alternative ways of looking at impact um, and getting that conversation moving forward. <clears throat> what, what did you call that? Alternate? Alternate metrics yeah so it's like alternative metrics um and i can find you all an example um and get that sent over but it's um it's fairly common or it's becoming more common and i will say that at our university we did get that open access publishing fund um we it's a combination of um, the library's resources combination of Research and Innovation, Alexa, and I think the provost. Um, so there is university support for open access. Um, and um, after that, it's going to depend on sort of like your your tenure options um, or your, your tenure expectations, I should say. Um, but there's university support, which means a lot. Any other questions? Want to I have about. one question. Yes. An article that was just published, and I think it's not a hybrid, but it, it is in a, in a journal that is, um, I guess, um, does both, right? And you, okay. you can get it if you're a member, you get the journal, uh, but you can also publish. And I did, we did gold publish, so it should be available. So if it's gold open access, then do I still need to send you guys that information to get it listed for us? Um, listed where exactly? Like where you said on, you know, where we could give you our work. Oh, in the repository. Yes. So at this point in time, um, we are not tech savvy enough to be able to crawl the internet and find all of your works that we um, have the copyright license availability to put into our repository. So if you are publishing works that you think can go into the repository, we do have an online form right now. Unfortunately, it's a Google form because Laserfish takes forever. Um, or you can contact me and I can um, ask you the questions I need to ask you um, to get your work added to the repository. Um, so okay, that could we'll do, yeah. I'll do that and I'll reach out to you, Alexa. Thanks. That would be great. Yeah, we'd be happy to host your works. Because we can do that for as well for co copyrighted material, like if we've copyrighted a model or something like that, right? Yes. Yeah. The repository is not just for, um, you know, f articles. Um, we would do uh, data sets. We've had um, teaching protocols if added for College of Ed. 
We just started a collection for the iCreate lab for templates that our, our student workers are creating um, for 3D projects. So the repository can be for a lot of different content. Okay, all right, thank you. Well, cool. I feel like if nothing else, Alexa and I just got, you know, something we can add to the repository. So this has been great for us. Um, <laughs> appreciate that, Tammy. Um, any other questions um, that we can address for you while we're here? We're also happy to, um, you can contact me at any point, contact Alexa um, with any questions that you have. We're accessible. Thank you guys. This was really, really helpful. I think there's just Absolutely. a lot of, when I just published an article, there was a lot of terminology I just didn't understand. And both of you were, were very helpful. That's why I thought this would be good to have this for, yeah, yeah. So for faculty. I'm so glad. Um, we are, so I'll put us onto the last slide here. Um, this is for um, an evaluation, which I think is necessary to get the DNE credits. Is that correct, Tammy? Yes. Yes, so if you guys uh, just scan with your barcoder and do the evaluation and you'll get, and I'll send you your certificate. Awesome. Thank you so much everyone for having us. Um, I really, I, I love working with um, the College of Nursing and Health Sciences. I feel extremely privileged to be your liaison. Um, so thank you so much for having me here. Um, thank you, Alexa, for doing the bulk of this presentation. Um, and this was great. I learned something too, so. Thank you all so much. And we know that copyright and open access are not the most straightforward things. There's a lot of nuances and complicated terms. So please don't hesitate to reach out. We're happy to answer any questions at any time. Absolutely. Thank you guys. I appreciate it. Perfect yes, timing. You're so welcome. You're right. Thank you for your wonderful questions. Back with us, Gloria and Kelly and Miguel. Perry. Sure. Thanks, Tammy. You can tell everybody what they missed. <laughs> we and we'll I'll send these slides out through the um, College of Nursing Health Sciences listserv. So if you need a refresher, if you want to pass this on to anyone else, uh, feel free. Thank you so much. You're Thank welcome. You. Have have a great day, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye, guys.